Hey everyone, my name is Noah Barnett. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Feather. And today in the studio, I am joined as always every Friday <laughs> by New Tay, a content strategist and the current curator of the Good Marketing Brief presented by Feather. Hey New, how are you doing? Hi Noah, I'm doing good, how are you? Doing all right. We are recording this on Halloween, yes. even though it doesn't come out till Friday. So normally I would say, my How is... pumpkin sweater. <laughs> there you go, your pumpkin sweater. So if you're watching this on Friday, yeah. New does not wear pumpkin sweaters randomly on Fridays. This is Halloween. Um, is Halloween. New, do you have like, are you costuming this year? We said, not... are we going to reveal what costume you're wearing tonight? Yeah, I'm not a costume girl, but okay. I like dressing up my dogs and my son. So my, my two dogs are going to be like narwhals. And my son is a walrus, so it's it's going to be all fun. How about you? I think, did, did you mention something last week? I, I think I did, or I don't remember if I gave the full lead, but I mm -hmm. am going as Winnie the Pooh. And so this oh, isn't the costume, right. yes, yes, but yes, yes, this is yes, yes. a stuffed animal of Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. I'm going to dress up like Winnie the Pooh and my partner's dressing up like Tigger. Mm -hmm. And we are actually mm -hmm. coach, we have practice tonight before trick-or-treating mm -hmm. with our U8 soccer team and so we're going to oh, coach awesome. practice in our halloween costumes to just throw the kids for a loop yeah and it's going to be a blast and so i'll have to update you all in the next brief on how that went um that sounds so yeah. fun take pictures i want to see <laughs> absolutely well as always every week we get into what was in this week's good marketing brief so mm -hmm. new what was the focus and topic of this week's brief yeah, absolutely. So uh, Giving Tuesday is very close. It's about four weeks away now. And so at this point, nonprofits probably have their plans basically finalized, ready for execution. They're probably just fine tuning some of the minute details um, to try and make it as engaging as possible when it launches on November 28th. So I thought it would be good to share some messaging and storytelling tactics this week to kind of inspire nonprofits in how to, you know, craft their fundraising, like fundraising appeals, fundraising copy, um, come garnering insight and strategies from a lot of for-profit brands. And I know we've kind of talked about this a lot. Um, and this week we talked a little bit about McDonald's <laughs> and a little bit about Sweet Green, both brands doing different things to kind of opening their consumer pool a little bit and kind of meet consumers where they are. Um, for McDonald's case, it's, you know, McDonald's is a fast food place, but they are trying to appeal to, um, with more budget-friendly menu items. And so with that, they've seen like more traffic with um, like lower income consumers, which has been great for them and has like skyrocketed their sales. And on the other hand, you know, Sweet Green has kind of grown also a fast food company, but more on like the healthy, um, rich food side of things. Um, and so they really bought into like kind of scaling intimacy within their brand and making sure that they stay true to their mission, stay true to the core of their company, which is providing healthier food options for people. Yeah. And what I love about these almost like two contrarian fast <laughs> food, fast casual brands, I guess, um, is they both really give us lessons that nonprofits can take. You know, you mentioned mm -hmm. McDonald's and their diversification of menu items to appeal to different consumer groups. And in the same way, as we think about messaging for nonprofits, mm -hmm. we need to consider both our everyday donors and our major donors and how we want to differentiate asks and differentiate like what type of messaging resonates with someone that's going to give you $10,000 versus someone that might want to donate $15. Mm -hmm. And on the sweet green side, you talked about that they've scaled through intimacy. Instead of me interpreting what that means, what, do, what does that actually look like? Or what were the lessons that you could pull out and apply to how nonprofits could use intimacy in their messaging at year end? Absolutely. So I think that for nonprofits, I think this is a good example, just to 
garner some insights from um, the chief brand officers in this interview that's highlighted in this article, talking about how they're scaling intimacy, which is basically just making sure that they are meeting consumer expectations, right? And so they're reaching out to the communities when there's, like, for example, there was, um, I think it was a hurricane that happened where they like, one of their food items was completely out. So they couldn't create this one menu item, but they wanted to make sure there was an um, alternative option for their consumers. So they created a whole new menu item without the peaches, but with, with blueberries and strawberries, things that they could um, get a hold of and have inventory for. And so ensuring that whatever they do in their in their operations, they are pivoting and kind of meeting those expectations, whatever happens. Yeah. And it, where it resonated with me, in addition to being just like in tune with the community, because I think that's something we talk a lot about here on Good Marketing Unplugged and in the brief, was they are embodying a similar tenant that McDonald's was. And really knowing and understanding your audience and make sure your audience sees themselves as participants in your uh, offerings. And so again, in, in Sweet Green's case, it was making sure that there's a reflection of the consumer in the menu offerings or kind of in how they design their food items. In McDonald's case, it was seeing options for people like me, in this case, lower income brackets, um, as you know, most menu items skyrocket. I even heard that there was a big back our Big Mac meals are ranging from thirteen to eighteen dollars now, which is you know crazy <laughs> compared to the six or seven dollars I remember back in the day. Yeah. But either way, like the the lower income consumer that maybe used to be a core base for McDonald's has now not seen themselves reflected, and so McDonald's is reversing that trend. It might be the same mm -hmm. in your organization. Like, how are you staying in tune? but also then being able to reflect your community back in the offerings to ensure you're not really disassociating yourself with some of your core supporters. Mm -hmm. And you highlighted another uh, resource, my interview with Jasmine Chavez, who's mm -hmm. the VP of Innovation, Communications and Equity at Hispanics in Philanthropy. And she talked a lot about this idea of the stories you tell can both have positive and negative impact on the communities you're telling that to. And so how do we ensure that we're like pausing and listening to the community and really designing stories in a way that they're going to resonate without disassociating? And so even though very different contexts, you have McDonald's, you have Sweet Green, and then you have Hispanics in philanthropy, mm -hmm. but like the goal and the outcomes of that are really transferable to you as a marketer listening to this because that's what you're doing is like, what does your community care about? How has that evolved? How do you not alienate, alienate any supporters? How do you tell stories that resonate broadly? And I think this is just a key way that we underappreciate. And I know I have in mm -hmm. optimizing our end of year campaigns. We usually talk, talk more on like strategy and tactics and this, that, and the other. And it really comes down to like the words and the stories and the offers that we're presenting to our, to our audience. Absolutely. Yeah, I really love that podcast. So kudos to you. Um, she referenced the amplification of the Latinx community and using their voices to tell their own stories and powering movements. Um, the one that really stood out to me was that one um, story toward the end of the podcast where they kind of partnered with an app that kind of triggers if there's a lot of shaking. So this has to do a lot with when there's like a lot of frisking to meet quotas for, you know, police officers. And, you know, by the by the recording of this this young man in this altercation, they were able to push the story forward and get a movement around it and kind of create more impact. So I think they're doing such amazing work there. And I really value that um her insights with her like career long work in uh, creating community change um, with their, their messaging. Yeah. And that what stood out to me about that story, in addition to just the powerful dynamic of leaning into the community you're trying to serve to help tell the story was 
not using creative liberties and just using the organic story. She told another story <laughs> of a uh, advocacy program where it was um, a specific restaurant that was mistreating its workers or were unfairly <laughs> treating its workers. And instead of like coming at it from the issue standpoint, they just came at it from like telling the stories of the workers, right? Like just tell what's true, like spotlight what was true. Yeah. And that's a powerful dynamic. And I would challenge listeners to this to be like, as you think about your year end campaigns, often we can get almost too creative and abstract on like what's going to resonate or what's going to work or what's the appeal this year. And there could just be opportunities for you just to tell what's truth. Mm -hmm. And that is a powerful exactly. way to mobilize people. And Jasmine kind of highlighted that throughout her career, where if you just tell the truth, how it can mobilize people. Yeah. Um, and this even goes back to like Cindy that we talked about a few weeks ago, where she was just saying, when we started telling the truth about the impact that these improvements in the children's hospital was having, people resonated with that. And I think it's like a constant theme we've kind of covered over the last three weeks, which is good marketing is just true yeah. as well in the stories mm -hmm. that you're sharing. And that is more the case when you're trying to stand out at year end, maybe just telling yeah. the truth and not <laughs> the truth. It's not that you weren't telling the truth before, but mm -hmm. it's that like, if you just like tell the facts of the story and the experience or allow the community that you're serving to tell the story, that can be, might be the most powerful messaging to use at year end. Absolutely. So we talked about like tactics and, and, and ways to think about like intimacy and um, uh, being intentional about tuning into your community, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about equity and storytelling. Uh, but then we get into like brain science and like mistakes. <laughs> and how did that, how does that like apply back to good marketing messaging at the end of your fundraising season? Absolutely. I shared an article from Inc. that really outlined some mistakes <laughs> or pitfalls that uh, some e commerce brands make in um, that's hurting their chances at generating more sales. And so, I mean, in all these mistakes, they're very relationship focused. Like first, it's not resonating emotionally with consumers. Two, it's not building trust with consumers. And then three, not following up with consumers, which is 100% applicable to nonprofits because it just goes to show that they are not alone. And so if they're prioritizing establishing emotional connections, doing their due diligence to acknowledge gifts, follow up, thank their donors for um, their contributions and their generosity or their support, um, it, it can go a very long way. And just staying consistent with those efforts, I think, is is really important, especially during year end, because you're getting such a high volume of traffic through your website, whether it's them finding you through digital ads, friends and family. Um, there's just like an opportunity to acquire new donors, but not just acquire them, but put efforts in place to ensure that they're not just supporting you once a year at year end and that you can carry that along to like the rest of the year. So I think that article is really valuable in that way. Um, and then another resource I shared was my friends at RKD Group, Evan Arcoria. He um, is the senior digital strategist over at RKD, and I actually did a webinar with him, I think it was like last year, around retention. And so he shared some quick tips um, to kind of amplify your Giving Tuesday campaign. And I think one of, with all the channels that he listed, he talked about email, he talks about website, he talks about digital ads, talks about texting. Um, um, Email obviously still rings true. It's still the most effective means of communicating with donors or consumers alike. Um, I know that we, like you, you guys are hosting a webinar on the 8th talking about some tactics around email marketing and kind of weaving it into omni channel campaigns. Um, but one of the things he talked about is email. And I really just want to highlight that email doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It doesn't have to be super sophisticated at the end of the day because of the attention span of donors and people. <laughs> you just want it to be short to the point. Tell them what you want to tell them, what's the most important thing, and then include a call to action. Um, but also 
include a deadline, especially on Giving Tuesday. That midnight deadline is so, so important. Um, and driving urgency like that can encourage either them to convert and give a gift. And if they already gave a gift and you're still kind of um, reaching out to them with follow-up communications about reach, reaching your goal, including a thermometer in your email, that could even encourage an additional gift. So really great, great, great stuff from our friends over there. Yeah. And the key point I took away was the one you just said, which is like email marketing doesn't have to be that complicated, but also mm -hmm. just this overall theme of, you know, we can talk about like intimacy and personalization and mm -hmm. equity and storytelling and all of these different things. And we can almost get caught up in it, but it also just comes down to what our friends over at the historic agency said, which is like, we just got to keep it simple. And they provided mm -hmm. three tips on how to do that this year end season. One was just like, make ideas easy to understand. <laughs> like if it's too complicated, it's, it's too complicated. And that's added friction for your listeners or for your readers. And so just keep it simple. Again, just tell the truth, just tell people what you want them to hear and no more. Mm -hmm. The second thing they said was give them a reason why. And they use a simple copywriting tactic that's been used for ages, which is to use because to convince people to act. Mm -hmm. And they provided three examples. Use social proof because 3,000 other people are giving too. Restate the impact because students like Natalie are counting on you. Add urgency because a child like Pedro shouldn't go to bed hungry tonight. You know, it's very simple stuff. Keep it clean. What do you want them to do? Use because and give a valid reason. And then last but not least, begin and end with strong words. And so it feels very elementary. And I think often we as professionals want things to feel hard because then like we earned like the right, like we got that appeal. It was tough, but like we got it done and got it out. And it's like, that might not be the best thing according to best practices or even yeah. in historic's case, neuroscience is <laughs> keep it simple, give reason why, yeah. begin and end with strong words. That's it. That's how you can use messaging uh, optimization to improve your outcomes this end of your season. And Absolutely. where we ended the brief this week was with some just like basic tests from our friends over at Next After. Mm -hmm. What was the learnings from those basic tests that you share at the end of the brief? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's just oh, there's so so in this resource they highlight six proven strategies, but also they give 33 examples of emic subject lines that work. And the one that I like the most is you know add mystery. I think I like that. Like they did a test and with a bunch of nonprofits, and adding mystery can boost email open rates, which is kind of like a hard metric to measure for because with all of the clutter and all of the emails that are coming through your donors inboxes, it can be hard to even catch their attention. So, you know, adding a little bit of mystery, but also combining it with the element of send it from a human. <laughs> You know, people want, humans want to hear from humans. They don't want to hear from brands and, you know, organizations like Compass International, I think saw like a over 300% increase in opens by just combining those two elements. I mean, there's a lot to garner from this, from this resource. It's definitely worth a look. Nathan Hill always um, delves into his experiments so deeply and offers a lot of examples um, and social proof along the way. Yeah. I love that on Halloween, we're, we're recording this, our best tip for you is to use mystery. mystery. I think that's why people love <laughs> Halloween is like, who's in that costume? What are you going to be like this excitement of just being able to like explore other spaces and, and be creative. And I think, again, there's a human connection to that. So exactly. keep it mysterious this mm -hmm. year end season as we go on. New, as always, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio every Friday. Uh, thank you for curating the Good Marketing Brief. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to subscribe to the Good Marketing Brief so you have it in your inbox every Wednesday morning, you can click on the link below and learn more, or you can read up on the latest briefs that we've written. Many of these are sent each week, but they're timeless in their insights. So check out the archive of the briefs through the link below. New, 
happy Halloween. A little you, late Emma. if you're listening to this on Friday, but uh, <laughs> enjoy your time. I hope the sea animals uh, are joyful this evening, and I'll tell you how the Hundred Acre <laughs> Wood characters go. Oh, um, I can't wait. And we'll talk about it next week on The Brief. Absolutely. It sounds great. Thanks, Neil. See you next week.